Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. This is Jonah, and he's overboard. A few minutes ago, he was up here with these guys, but they threw him into the sea. To understand why, let's back up. Jonah was a prophet. He got messages from God and delivered them to people. God will restore our land. Everything was fine until God gave him this message. Dear Nineveh, in 40 days you will be destroyed. Jonah didn't like the message, and he really didn't like Nineveh. So he did what any of us might do when confronted with the clear, unchanging will of an all-powerful God. He ran. He ran in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And he didn't stop at the sea. He kept going on this boat with these guys. Until they realized that Jonah was the cause of this horrible storm that tossed their ship and they tossed him overboard. That's when Jonah met the very big fish. Fish stomachs are strange places, but they get you thinking about life. And Jonah realized he'd made a mess of his. He decided that God's way is the best way, no matter what. And he got the chance to prove it. Jonah arrived in Nineveh, a foreign city filled with godless people. He knew his mission. He held his message. All that remained was a choice. Speak or run. Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed! With those words, Jonah went overboard again. Not like a fool being tossed to the sea, but like a man diving headfirst into destiny. And something wonderful happened. People were saved. A triumph of mercy sent to motion by one man armed with eight words and the decision to stop running and start talking. That is the story of Jonah and the really big fish. That's gonna leave a stink. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. My name is Adam McIntyre. I am one of the Grow Group coordinators here at Faith Bridge. I'm also on the teaching team. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here with you all this morning. Today, we are going to be walking through the end of the Jonah story, which I feel like I need to warn you is not really anything like the video uh, that we just saw. Like, I feel like that version of the story, it's adorable, it's cute, but it's kind of like if Disney made a movie about the Jonah story and uh, they decide to like make this real clear character arc and Jonah learns this valuable lesson about obedience and there's this happy ending. Like what a wonderful children's story, right? Well, we're gonna discover this morning that this great children's story is also a terrible children's story. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale that I used to read all the time as a kid. In my children's version of that book, Right before the wolf eats Little Red Riding Hood, a woodsman with an ax busts through the door and scares the wolf off into the woods and Little Red Riding Hood lives happily ever after. Then when I got older, I read the original version of the fairy tale, like the one written in the 1600s. And in the original version, the woodsman does not show up in time. In fact, the woodsman doesn't show, off, show up at all. And when Little Red Riding Hood says, my, what big teeth you have, Grandma, the wolf goes, yeah, because I'm a wolf. I'm clearly not your grandmother. And then he eats her. And that's it. That's the end. That's the whole story. Like, can you imagine Disney putting their logo on that version of the story? No way. And so while the ending of Jonah isn't quite that dark, uh, we are going to discover how it's not nearly as happy or as satisfying as the video would make it out to be. However, my prayer is that God will humble all of us today and open our hearts and our eyes to the radical depths of his grace and that we will leave here today hopeful and inspired 
by the Jonah story. So we're going to jump right in. We're going to start in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, go ahead and raise your hand. Ushers are coming down the aisle now. They can bring you one. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, please keep that one. We love you, and that's our gift to you. So Jonah chapter 3, we're going to start by reading verses 1 through 4. Here we go. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. So Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay, so Jonah has just escaped the belly of the whale and immediately makes his journey to the city of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is, uh, was considered to be kind of like the, the seat or the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And so he goes into Nineveh to proclaim God's message. And I want to give you a little bit of context so you can understand just how terrifying this journey would have been for Jonah. So the Assyrian Empire is considered to be the, world, the world's first true empire. They were the first to attempt globalization. They were the first to attempt to impose a single language on all of the peoples and nations that they conquered. And they were the first to have a true standing army where the people's full-time job was just to be in the Assyrian military. And on top of being the first empire, they were also considered to be one of the most, if not the most, brutal empires in the history of the world. Uh, in fact, the prophet Nahum, he called Nineveh the city of blood. And he said that anywhere the Assyrians marched, there were, quote, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. The Assyrians would do things like they would construct lavish towers out of the severed heads of their enemies. And then for entertainment, they would publicly skin people alive and then mock their screams of terror. I think two examples is enough. You get it, right? They were awful. Awful people. And so here's poor Jonah, and he has just escaped the belly of one beast, only to enter into the belly of a much more dangerous, much more terrifying beast. And I can't imagine the terrifying anticipation that Jonah must have experienced as he opened his mouth to speak with his foreign tongue against an empire that was known for their brutality and their wickedness. I mean, I still get nervous every time before I preach. Every single time. I've preached hundreds of times. This is like my 10th or 11th time to preach from this stage. And still, all week, I chewed off all my nails. And I can never sleep the night before. And the morning of, I can't eat anything because I have so many butterflies in my stomach. And like, really, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Right? Like, I get up here and then just completely freeze and have nothing to say. And then a few awkward moments pass. And then Ken comes out and puts his arm around me and walks me off the stage and then apologizes. And then that would be it. Right? That would be, that's worst case scenario. <laughs> and the only thing that would really be hurt in that situation would be my pride. Because you're all lovely, gracious people. None of y'all want to hurt me. None of y'all want to kill me, as far as I know, I hope. <laughs> but the audience that Jonah is about to speak to is not nearly as lovely. And there are no promises in the book of Jonah that he won't be immediately burned or mangled or buried alive. So here's poor Jonah. He's in the belly of the Assyrian Empire, and he calls out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then he sits and he waits, probably for someone to come cut his throat. But that moment never comes. Instead, something much more miraculous happens. And we're going to discover that Jonah's deepest fear is not his own death, but it's something else entirely. So let's keep going with the next verse. We're going to read verses uh, 5 through 10 of chapter 3. Here we go. So Jonah calls out, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a, a fast, and they put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he removed his robe, and he covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, uh, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. 
Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So, the king of Nineveh hears about Jonah's kamikaze sermon, and then he unimaginably, miraculously, calls for the entire city of Nineveh to repent of its evil and its violence. And they do. They all humble themselves and they repent in sackcloth and ash, which was unthinkable. It was truly a miracle. There's this excellent book called Sympathy for Jonah by David Blower. And he calls this moment an apocalyptic paradigm shift. And what an apocalyptic paradigm shift is, is that it's a moment when the entire world gets flipped upside down and you're now living in this impossible alternative reality where everything is just miraculous and surreal. So a more recent example of a apocalyptic paradigm shift um, comes from World War I. There's this event known as the Christmas Truce of 1914. And what happened was the British and German soldiers had dug themselves into trenches and had been fighting each other for days, shooting at each other. But then for some reason, On Christmas Eve night, the shooting stops, and they begin to sing Christmas carols to each other across enemy lines. And then the next morning, on Christmas Day at dawn, some of the German soldiers, they emerge from their trenches, and they begin to approach the English soldiers, calling out Merry Christmas to them in English. And at first, the English soldiers, they were sure that it was a trap. But when the German soldiers got closer and they could see that they were unarmed, they also emerged from their trenches and they spent the day exchanging gifts of cigarettes and plum pudding, and they sang Christmas carols together, and they even played a few games of soccer together in no man's land. And this truce lasted for about a day until the higher-ups in command heard what they were doing and then demanded that they start killing each other again. But still, for a full day, these soldiers experienced this apocalyptic paradigm shift. For a full day, they lived in an alternate reality where they were not enemies trying to kill each other, but instead they were old friends who exchange gifts and sing songs and play soccer together. It was truly a miracle. And what happened in Nineveh was even more miraculous in nature. I mean, these people, they were murderers. They were terrorists. They were depraved, wicked people. And then in a moment... The city of blood transforms into the city of sackcloth and ash. It was truly a miracle. And you would think that this would be a moment for celebration for Jonah. I mean, this is unthinkable. But this miraculous paradigm shift is going to reveal Jonah's deepest fears instead. So let's read the next few verses. Jonah 4, verses 1 through 4. See how Jonah responds. But it, being God's grace, him relenting, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster." Therefore now, O Lord, please just take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? So let's pause there again for a moment. So Jonah, upon seeing the uh, the Ninevites repent and humble themselves, his heart drops and his stomach churns. And then when God decides to show them grace, And mercy, it says that Jonah was displeased. Another translation of the Hebrew there would be that Jonah found it to be exceedingly evil. So think about that for a moment. Jonah, a prophet of God, upon witnessing the radical depths of God's grace, found it to be exceedingly evil. He becomes infuriated upon witnessing it. He says, like, God, this is the whole reason that I ran in the first place. Like, I would rather live in disobedience. I would rather you kill me 
than sit here and watch you love and forgive these animals. See, for Jonah, his deepest fear was not being murdered by this violent empire. His deepest fear was God's love and compassion and mercy for this violent empire. And for Jonah, the call to have compassion for such monsters just seemed distasteful to the extreme. And then the call to respond to this violent empire, not with weapons or armed resistance, but by going to them and talking things over, that's absurd. That's insane. Who does that? Like if anyone else but God had suggested this idea to Jonah, he would have been like, what are you talking? He would have laughed in their face. He said, what are you talking about? Get out of here. Go join the Peace Corps or something. But God had called Jonah to trade in the logic of eye for an eye and embrace the insanity of turn the other cheek. God called Jonah to turn away his allegiance from the borders and walls of Israel that had kept him safe and made him feel comfortable and instead give his full allegiance to God who is above all borders. And most difficult of all, Jonah was called to stop seeing his enemies as evil animals and instead he was called to search for the image of God and his enemies and offer them grace. And Jonah found this call to be extremely difficult and exceedingly evil. And I suspect that if you and I are honest, we are not so different. Right? Like we don't want to see this world filled with those kinds of people. In our minds, those kind of people deserve punishment. They deserve hell. Like we don't want to see ISIS receive forgiveness. We want them to receive punishment and justice. We don't want to watch Nazis grow old. Like most Americans, uh, I celebrated the day that I heard that Osama bin Laden was killed. Celebrate. I was high-fiving strangers and chest-bumping people in the streets. And I still, right now, right in this moment, cannot even fathom trying to search for the image of God in that man. And if he was still alive, I can't fathom going to him and offering God's love and grace. Like, e- even thinking about it puts knots in my stomach. Like, it feels disrespectful to his victims and their families. It feels disrespectful to the heroic acts of the men and women who worked to stop his terrorism and to save lives. And if you're feeling that same knot in your stomach, or maybe you're even offended at the idea of loving and forgiving such a man, well, now you're starting to see things from Jonah's perspective. The grace of God is beautiful to us and worth singing songs about when it's for us and when it's for the good guys. But this story reveals a truth in Jonah and in us that the grace of God is also awful to us because for us, the logical, reasonable response to evil is to fear it and desire its destruction, not to love it and desire its redemption. That's insane. But at the same time, I'll say this. Thank God for his awful grace that defies logic and puts knots in our stomach. Thank God that he so loved the evil people of Nineveh because you and I need that same grace. Now, granted, I, I would imagine, I would hope, that none of us here have committed the crimes against humanity that the Assyrians were known for. However, how many of us have, knowingly or unknowingly, seen a person in need and then just crossed to the other side of the street? How many of us benefit from a system that marginalizes some while giving privileges to others? How many of us root for the cowboys instead of the Texans? (laughs) Repent. I'm kidding, we love all, even Cowboys fans, we love you. You're welcome here. But I mean, think about that. Like how many of us, how, like how many of us turn a blind eye to atrocities that are happening all around us all the time, either because it doesn't affect us or because our team is winning, whether that's our country or our faith group or our political group or our business or whatever it is, or because maybe we think, well, it's either us or them. And how many of us twist and rationalize the clear commands of Jesus in order to fit our own sense of right and wrong? Like, yes, Jesus has called me to love my enemies and to turn the other cheek and to pray for them, and I do that almost all the time. 
But I mean, if someone's trying to harm me, or if someone's trying to harm my family, or if someone's attacking my country, I mean, what do you expect me to do? Like, it is illogical, it's unreasonable. I think it's wrong to expect me to try to love someone who's trying to harm me. And with that line of thinking, now we find ourselves in the same boat as Jonah, fleeing God's clear command because it's illogical, it's unreasonable, and it's just plain wrong. We are not so different from Jonah, but God's grace is relentless. And he pursues us even when we are in open rebellion. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. While we were enemies, God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, his one and only son. And Jesus did what no one else could do. He lived a life of faithful obedience. He was faithful all the way to his death on the cross because of his love for mankind. Even the Roman soldiers who beat him and tortured him and nailed him to a cross. Jesus didn't pray for their death or damnation. Jesus prayed, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. They're confused. They're lost. That's because Jesus knew that the real enemy is never, ever flesh and blood. Ever. The real enemies that Jesus came to defeat are Satan, sin, and death. And after Jesus drew his final breath on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. And then in the ultimate apocalyptic paradigm shift, three days later, the tomb was empty. Jesus had resurrected from the grave. He conquered death. And in doing so, he flipped the world upside down. He introduced this new, surreal, miraculous reality in which Satan had been defeated, death has lost its sting, and our sins have been forgiven by the power of his blood. And he invites all of us, every single one of us, to join him in this new reality. Right here, right now. He calls all of us to surrender our lives, to die to ourselves, and to take up our own cross and join him in his new world. And so how do we do that? Like, what does it mean to surrender ourselves, to die to ourselves? And and like, how do we take up our own cross? Like, we don't have crosses anymore. That's not a thing. But how do we do that? Well, that's a long answer, but I think that the ending of the book of Jonah can point us in the right direction, and it can give us a great first step. So after uh, Jonah and God have their argument, Jonah then retreats to a spot where he kind of overlooks the city of Nineveh, and then he sits and he waits and he watches, probably, I imagine, hoping that their repentance doesn't stick and that maybe they revert back to their evil ways so that then maybe God would still destroy them. Uh, but as he's sitting there waiting, it's a scorcher. It's hot out, right? And, uh, and so God provides this plant that gives him shade. And Jonah was like, I know before I said, like, just go ahead and kill me. But man, it was so hot out. That's a miserable way to die. So thanks for the shade, God. And then God sends a worm. And the worm attacks the plant. And the plant withers and dies. At which point, Jonah is like, you know what? Just kill me. Just get it over with. Just kill me now. I want to die. And that's where we'll pick it up. We'll read the last three verses of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and then perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, also there's cows. (laughs) I love that ending. (laughs) If you don't care about the people, sure you care about the cows, right? Um, (laughs) So in this passage, God is attempting to teach Jonah the very first lesson in surrender and dying to yourself, and that is humility. So Jonah thinks that he knows best. Jonah thinks that he knows right from wrong. He thinks he knows what's good and what's evil. He thinks he knows what's just and what's unjust. But his perspective is warped. Like his, his reality is very limited. His vision is biased. And so God is trying to humble Jonah by showing him just how warped his perspective really is. God says, you have pity for this plant, which you didn't create, 
which you didn't water to make it grow, and which gave you shade for a day, yet you have no pity for these human beings? Like none whatsoever? See, from Jonah's perspective, these humans, they were animals. They were an infestation. They were less than human. But that was not God's perspective. See, God knew every strand of their hair. God knew every strand of their DNA. God had created them and formed them with his own hands and he breathed life into them with his own breath. God loved those evil people of Nineveh more intensely than you or I have ever loved anything. And so God asked Jonah, you have pity on a plant. Should I not pity 120,000 of my own wayward children? And with that question, God is trying to draw Jonah and us to a place of humility. God is trying to open our eyes to our own very limited reality. We have a very small world. Our vision, our perspective is biased. And he's trying to open our hearts and grow our compassion. You can even see God teaching humility in the way that he describes the Ninevites. He says they don't know their right hand from the left. So Jonah sees them as these evil animals, right? But God, he sees them as his confused children. They don't know what they're doing. They're confused. God is trying to teach Jonah and us to see the world through his eyes as much as that's possible. God is trying to correct our perspective. When I was around five years old, uh, my parents had divorced and I was uh, living with my mom. And for a while, it was just me and my mom until she started dating this guy named Chuck. And Chuck had two sons, Ryan and Walker. And this is a story about the first time that I met Ryan. Now, let me preface by saying that my my mom ended up marrying Chuck, and he was and is a wonderful stepfather, and I love both my brothers, have a great relationship with him. But when I was five, I did not have these warm feelings. And I was also a very spoiled five-year-old. Like, my mom and dad are both awesome, and I received all of their love and attention because I was their only child. And even when I was just living with me and my mom, I received all of her love and attention. And then Chuck shows up, with his two sons, and I'm immediately threatened because these people are trying to steal away my mom's love and attention from me, right? Uh, And the person who posed the greatest threat to me was Ryan. See, Chuck was an adult, and Walker was already almost a teenager by this point, but Ryan, Ryan was just a few days older than I was. And so Ryan enters my house, and he's all cocky, and he has his hair parted down the middle, he has his cool Jinko jeans, and... (laughs) He walks right up to me and he shakes my hand. He says, hi, I'm Ryan. And he pulls me in close. He points over my mom. He says, she's my mom now. (laughs) Not really. He didn't really do that. Uh, (laughs) But in my mind, that's exactly what he was wanting to do, right? That's what he was thinking. (laughs) So tensions are high between Ryan and myself. Everyone can feel it. And so my mom says, hey, Adam, why don't you take Ryan into your room? You can show him your toys. And I thought, perfect. This is a chance for me to show Ryan my Ninja Turtle collection and establish dominance. (laughs) And uh, Ryan could care less, though, about my Ninja Turtle collection. Instead, he spotted a guitar over in the corner of my room, and he immediately goes over and picks it up and starts trying to play it. Quick note about this guitar. At this point, I had never never once touched or even thought about playing that guitar. But as soon as he touched it, it instantly became my most valuable possession. And so I I start yelling at him. I'm like, put down that guitar that's mine. You can't touch it. When the yelling didn't work, I started inventing lies and threats. I said, that guitar is so valuable, and if my mom finds out that you're touching it, you're going to be in such big trouble. Of course, he saw right through it, didn't care. So then I tried to physically take it away from him. But I was five, and he was eight, and I was never, ever going to win in a physical confrontation. So in a move that I'm still weirdly proud of to this day, I go into the kitchen and I get a pair of scissors and I come back into the room and as he's playing it, I just cut all the strings of the guitar and I say, now no one can play the guitar, Ryan. This is my house, Ryan, right? Like establishing dominance, right? Because Ryan was an intruder. He was an invader. He had invaded my territory and he was trying to take what was mine. He was a threat to me and my way of life. At least least that's how I perceived Ryan to be, even though I hadn't even tried to get to know him yet. And so for me, the sensible, reasonable thing to do was to fight back, establish dominance, treat him as a hostile, even if it meant damaging my own stuff. 
And I think that this is a mindset that a lot of us, we never really grow out of. Right? Like it's sensible to want to fight back against people who we think are trying to harm us or who are against us. It's reasonable to fear and hate people who we perceive to be our enemy. And what God is trying to teach Jonah and us is that just because we think something is reasonable or sensible or good or just doesn't mean that it actually is. God is trying to break down our worldview and dismantle our old ways of thinking and behaving. So God doesn't humble us to try to bring us back to our senses. He's trying to free us from them. God is trying to unhinge us from reason. And when we allow God to humble us, and when we, when we dismantle our old ways of thinking and behaving, that is when we can begin to take up our cross. Because that's when we can say, you know what, my old self would fight back. My old self would hoard resources. My old self would fear and hate my enemies, but my old self is dead and has been crucified along with Jesus, and I am now a new creation. God has created in me a new heart, a new vision, a new way of seeing the world. So now I can be obedient to his every call, even his call to love my enemies, even if it appears to be completely absurd. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, no one can enter the kingdom without first being reborn. And the one who wants to keep his own life is going to lose it. But the one who gives it up, the one who surrenders it, the one who dies to self for the sake of the kingdom will receive it back again. So for the sake of the kingdom, we must take up our own cross and dismantle our old ways of thinking and behaving. For the sake of the kingdom, we must allow God to humble us and to create in us a new heart. And for the sake of the kingdom, we must learn to love like Jesus and to search for the image of God in others, especially our enemies. And we need to do this with a sense of urgency. Because it seems now, at least to me, like every day I see people who claim to follow Jesus who belittle and dehumanize other people. It seems like I can't turn on the news or get on social media without seeing Christians direct hatred and bigotry towards whole groups of people, especially, particularly refugees and immigrants and minority groups. And every time that this happens, we lose our witness. And every time that we see this happen and we don't call it out, we lose our witness, not to mention the harm that we cause those people. We must learn to search for the image of God and others. And if we don't, then we've traded in the gospel for our own version of Tarshish, whether that's safety or nationalism or comfort or whatever it is. And this is something that I have to work on constantly within myself. I have a lot of hidden anger. I have a lot of subconscious prejudices and Writing this sermon has revealed to me that I have a lot more dying to do. And maybe you do too. And so I think that a good practical first step towards dying to yourself and towards learning to search for the image of God in your enemy is to just turn off anything that is trying to sell you fear. There are people and politicians and businesses and news organizations that are trying to sell you an enemy in order to push their own agenda. And if you sense that someone is pushing an agenda in order to try to sell you an enemy, reject it, resist it, and remember scripture that our war is never ever against flesh and blood. And if someone is trying to tell you otherwise, resist it, turn it off. And instead, embrace the things that grow compassion in you. A great place to start would be to go see the new Mr. Rogers documentary. It's incredible. Bring tissues. (laughs) I'll say this too you'll know that you're on the path towards taking up your cross when you stop looking for the sensible option and you start looking for the compassionate option. When you stop seeing other people as a threat and you see them as beloved children of God. And I love the way that the book of Jonah ends with God asking Jonah a question that we never ever get an answer to. Like, should I not pity the people of Nineveh? And then that's it. This, like the story feels unfinished. It feels like we're left with this cliffhanger that we never get resolution. Like, like how does Jonah respond? What, what does he say? What does he do next? Is he ever changed? We don't know. But I think maybe we can view that as an opportunity or as an invitation 
to start the story over again and to put ourselves back into Jonah's shoes and feel the weight of God's call. Like, put yourself in Jonah's shoes. How does this story end for you? Will you allow God to humble you and to break down narrow ways of thinking? Or will you flee to Tarshish because you think you know better? Will you die to your own sensibilities, your own reason, your own logic, and learn to search for the image of God in your enemy? Or will you continue to view the world through your own warped perspective of fear and hatred? Will you remember that while you were an enemy, Jesus died for you and offered you love and grace? And then will you take up your own cross and offer the love and grace of Jesus to your enemy? Or will you, like Jonah, reject God's grace and just sit in stubborn defiance? There is a kingdom being built right now, right here in our midst. And this kingdom points to a new world in which enemies at war put down their weapons and exchange gifts instead. It points to a new reality where even the most wicked and depraved among us repent and receive God's grace. And King Jesus is inviting all of us to follow him into this new world and to live in that new reality right now. So, will you reject that invitation and flee? Or... Will you follow Jesus into that new world and live in that new reality and embrace God's grace? Let's pray. Father, um, I'm just hopeful that right now your Holy Spirit is doing a transformative work in all of our hearts because the, the task to love and offer grace to people that we think or we know want to hurt us and that might hate us, that just seems so impossible. It doesn't seem smart. And so God, we need you to break down our ways of seeing the world, our ways of thinking, our reason, our logic. We need you to just build in us a new heart. A heart that um, is just beating with your love and your compassion. Father, and I pray that if there's anyone in this room right now who doesn't know your grace and love, maybe because they've thought, I just don't deserve it, I'm too wicked for it. I pray that they read this story and realize just how deep and wide your grace and love truly is and that it is absolutely for them. And all they need to do is just say, yes, I want it, and then surrender to you. Father, and for those of us who are struggling with obedience, again, We ask that you break us down, humble us. And Father, uh, right now as we come to worship you, again, I pray that your Holy Spirit is just present here and that as we sing about your amazing grace, we remember that this grace is so wide that it's for everyone. Father, we love you and we're so thankful. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Good afternoon and welcome to Postscript. My name is Tyler Riley, high school pastor. I'm here with Adam McIntyre, Grow Group Coordinator, who just gave an incredible message uh, wrapping up our Jonah series. Um, And so, Adam, we do have a couple of questions. We can just jump right into it. Absolutely. Uh, So the first question is this. Uh, You talked about where Scripture references bearing your cross. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, we don't have crosses today. So what exactly does that mean to bear your cross today? Right. Well, uh, like I said, I kind of went through the first step, I think, of of bearing your cross, which is allowing God to humble you um, and just breaking down um, your, you know, any preconceived notions that you had, uh, your previous worldviews, your your own version of right or wrong, and then allowing Scripture and the Holy Spirit to begin to form in you um, like a new way of seeing the world, um, new perspectives, new uh, sense of right and wrong, um, and what is just and what's unjust. Um, and I think that also involves repentance, right? You saw the people of Nineveh repent, and I think in order to do that, we have to turn away, again, from our old ways of living, our old ways of acting, um, in order to embrace 
uh, God's call. Um, and beyond that, then it's this slow process of dying to yourself, which I think is a continual thing. It's something that you're going to be doing uh, for the rest of your life. Like none of us ever learn to carry our cross perfectly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so every day it's picking something else out that you know I'm not obedient in this way, or I have anger towards this person, I have hatred towards this person, um, and I need to die to that and allow God to, to create something new in me. And um, it's almost like you can, you can take the fruit of the Spirit and uh, think, okay, like what practical steps can I take to help grow this fruit in my life, mm. right? Like if I'm struggling with patience, then what is a practical thing that I can do uh, to actually work to grow patience. And so doing those little bit things every day, you're, you're killing off your old way of living and thinking, um, and you're allowing God and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you and to, and to build you into something new. And I don't think it necessarily means that you um, are going to die um, like as a martyr. Maybe. I, God absolutely calls uh, some Christians to, um, to die uh, for the sake of the kingdom. Um, but what I do think it means for all Christians is that we do need to kill off our old selves. That, I mean, that's part of what baptism is, right? Um, yep. We're buried with Christ's death, and when we're raised, we are a brand new person. Um, and so, again, practically speaking, it's hard to lay out. You do A plus B plus C, and then that equals carrying your cross. Uh, but I think it's just that gradual process of learning to uh, die to yourself and uh, be obedient to the commands of Jesus. Right, which as you said is a daily thing. It's Absolutely. a daily decision right. on the skin. Uh, you also referenced the people of Nineveh, which kind of segues perfectly into our next question, which is, uh, so God um, showed grace to Nineveh and the people of Nineveh heard, you know, he, they heard Jonah's call right. and then they were repentant. Um, but what about those who hear that call and their hearts are still hardened um, or yeah. they aren't repentant? What about those? Uh, that's a great question. And I don't know if my answer is going to be very satisfying because uh, I think that a lot of Christians will try to speculate on uh, whether or not a person uh, truly repent, repented and um, received God's grace and, you know, and received Jesus and, and is going to be saved or if they didn't repent and, uh, and then what's going to happen to them. And, and we tend to speculate about that, that a lot when in reality, it, I mean, if we really look at the message and the theme of the Jonah story, it's that God's grace is far more expansive than we could possibly fathom. And we can't begin to even start guessing um, who's in and who's out, right? And I know we like to think of that way a lot of times because we like things to be black and white. Um, and, and I'll also say there is a clear uh, theme in scripture too that we absolutely do need to repent. Mm. And we absolutely do need to turn away from uh, evil and sin um, that has infected our life before. Uh, that's definitely a part of it. And without repenting, um, then we are absolutely rejecting God's grace, right? Um, you, you, can't, you can't accept it without repenting. Um, but at the same time, uh, I don't know if we can speculate about what God is doing with his grace, basically. Right. Like who he's giving it to, who, uh, like it's just, uh, we don't know. Um, and so I tend to kind of go towards, there's a, a theologian named Karl Barth, um, who said, I don't know um, if everyone's going to be saved, uh, but I think it's the 